Hey, everybody. Welcome back to CAF Heroes of Sport. My name is Bob Babbitt, co-founder of Challenged Athletes Foundation. It's always my honor to interview some of the world's greatest challenged athletes. And this is, today is no different. We get to talk to, well, let's see, two-time Paralympian, three-time Paralympic medalist with two silvers and a bronze. And my favorite, been to, I think, five world championships, nine-time world championship medalist with three golds, four silvers, two bronze. Jill Walsh joins us. How you doing, Jill? Good, Bob. Uh, thanks for uh, having me on. Always an honor. Let's talk about Tokyo because that was such a different Paralympics from, from Rio. The fact that you were sheltered in place and basically you really didn't get to see Tokyo. Talk a little about just this experience compared to Rio. Um, yeah, it was a lot harder, obviously, with the year on uh, delay in training, too. And in the back of your mind, you never really knew if the games were going to take place. Yeah. If, no matter what was going to happen with the pandemic. Um, so it was always kind of, is it really going to happen? A lot of training by ourselves. We didn't have really training camps. Um, but, uh, you know, Tokyo, I, like, I would love to go back and visit the country when um, they're more open and beautiful country. But it was it was challenging, first of all, not having your family there and uh, just being so isolated. I mean, there was notes in our hotel. If you leave the hotel, you will be disqualified. So it, they were pretty strict. I mean, they needed to be. They did. But it's 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 still pretty scary. Yeah. So talk a little bit about, uh, you were a triathlete before all everything happened. Uh, and talk about when were you diagnosed with MS and, and how did it affect you? Um, I was diagnosed in 2010. I um, was I was always very athletic my whole life. Um, and so I always had little odd things here and there. This would go numb. But I just chalked it up to overtraining, something, you know, didn't really, I still played soccer two days a week in an adult league. I mean, I was just always a very avid runner. Um, so I always just chalked it up to, I must have strained something, trained too hard. But in 2010, or yeah, I was um, suffered from bouts of dizziness and vertigo that just wouldn't relent. I was training for my first half Ironman. And yeah. uh, so I went to the doctors and they thought it was an inner ear infection, gave me some antibiotics. I got better for a bit, then it came back, just kept going back and forth until they finally sent me to a ear, nose and throat. And he ran a bunch of tests and uh, kind of pinpointed that it was my central nervous system. I didn't really know what that meant at the time. So he sent me for an MRI and then it was pretty apparent, but even with that, there's no definitive test for MS. So they have to rule out everything else, but they were pretty sure that's what it was. And that's how the, the diagnosis came about. Well, and as somebody who was a you know, state trooper and you're doing triathlon, how did you have to change your life? Well, at first I didn't really, um, that's the, the disease, like it, it, you have a, a flare and then you pretty much go back to your baseline after a few weeks, you go in for some high dose steroids and then you're pretty much back to where you are. And then uh, was not until 2011 Christmas time, it was Christmas Eve actually, that I entered my first big major relapse where I couldn't walk or, or anything afterwards. That's when it became real to me and I was left with foot drop on one side after that. So, and I was actually, I had signed up for an Ironman that July, uh, Lake Placid. And uh, so that was when it first, like, oh, this is real. This is going to affect my life. Cause for a while you can just kind of be in denial and then, yeah, then it hits. So when, when you have MS and it's one of those sort of invisible type of things, because it's somebody's an amputee, you see what they're missing. If somebody's in a wheelchair, you see what they're, what they're dealing with. A lot of times do people not quite realize what you're dealing with? Um, yeah, a lot. I mean, it isn't invisible uh, until it becomes so apparent that it's not invisible, but, and, and it's not anything that I'm going to get over. I'm going to get worse all, as time, as they always say in the MS world, um, you're not going to die of it, probably not going to die of it, but you are going to die with it. So it's just something you have to, it's more like a chronic condition. You have to learn to, to deal with it. Um, and a couple of years ago, I changed when you're first diagnosed, most people are um, relapsing, remitting. And then you'll turn into uh, more progressive. And I turned, so I don't have any big relapses anymore. I just get a little bit worse as time goes on. And how do you deal with that? You just have to adapt. You just have, I mean, you don't have a choice. <laughs> when, when did you connect with CAF? 
Um, it's kind of a funny story. I had signed up to do Iron Man Lake Placid. I love it up there. I don't know if you've ever been there. It's like God's country to me. I was there for the first one. One of the first ones. Yeah, it's beautiful. And uh, yeah, it's a pretty big commitment. Like I had started off doing half Ironman and then, and so it's a big commitment financially, time-wise, everything. And it was in July of 2012, but in December of 2011, that's when I had my first big relapse. And when I came out of that relapse, I had foot drop and I wore a brace on my foot to hold my foot up. Um, And I was still bound and determined to do Placid. And I kissed, kept Googling um, what, because it's a two loop swim. I, what, a, what can I ask for? What kind of accommodations can I mm-hmm. ask for? And CAF came up on every Google search I could uh, come up <laughs> with. And I'm like, huh, you ever like here? Uh, well, then I went up to Lake Placid and they actually had a booth set up there at the Ironman. Yep. And yeah, and I started chatting with the people in there. And then some athletes would come and go. And you ever like, something hits you or you hear about something and you just think this is going to be important in my life and I had no idea what that meant or how that was going to be but it just like stuck to me huh I think this is going to be something important in my life so I finished that Iron Man like by the grace of God I don't know how I managed to finish it but I did and um when I was there I met an athlete who had done the uh, million dollar challenge ride and I had never been to the state of California. And I just thought, oh, this sounds right up my, my alley. This is in, in my wheelhouse. And so I put in an application and uh, I didn't know anybody. I didn't really know a whole lot about CAF, but I just, and they accepted me to come up as a challenged athlete. And that was in 2013. Um, I don't know if you want me to tell the whole story. Yeah, now, I do. But- I want it all. <laughs> so I flew out to California. Oh, it was my flight was canceled, delayed, whatever. I got there late. I was tired. I didn't know anybody. And it's, you know, that's a that's a pretty hefty undertaking right down the coast. And that was probably the longest week of my life. I was still on a two-wheel bike at that point. Wow. I knew that my balance was really challenged. Like even when I did the Iron Man, I had carried almost everything with me and I had certain uh, aid stations I knew I was going to stop at. There were people there to help me get off my bike, get out of my bike. Like it was very well planned out. Um, yes. But where I live in upstate New York, Syracuse, New York, you can ride your bike. Like we had a half Ironman course around here. You could ride the whole entire course and not stop at a traffic light or a stop. Like you could literally do that. Yeah. In California, you can't do that. Yeah, go block. and every time I'd stop at a traffic light I'd fall off my bike or almost every single time it was like a more sane person probably would have just went home but I was like I was going to do this I was going to do this and I remember we were just south of LA where it's not like the most scenic beautiful part of the ride yeah (laughs) and I am once again at a traffic light on the asphalt and I look over and I see um a guy riding a three-wheel bike Stephen Peace. I'm sure you know him. Oh, yeah. The, the, the trike I just, whisperer. Yeah, the trike whisperer. I gave him that name, trike whisperer. Did you really? Just, yes. And I just remember like looking, I didn't really know him. I never talked to him that whole ride, but I just remember thinking, huh, I just like put that in my, in my head. And when I went home after that long, long week, um, after about a month, I was pretty miserable. And my husband's like, mm, you don't like you and we don't like you. We have to figure out something here. And so I just sent Stephen an email. I said, hi, I was on the ride with you. I'm really interested in the type of bike you ride. I'd like to know more about it. And he got right back to me and he said, um, well, actually it's a regular bike and you put a conversion axle on it. Um, it uh, they're hard to get. They're made in England. There's very few of them. He said, I have one. I'll loan you if you agree to race it. He said, I saw you, you're very strong. You're just not on the right bike. And I got right back to him and I said, oh, thanks for the information. I'd love to borrow your your axle. Uh, I'm not really interested in racing. He got right back to me. Clearly you didn't understand. I will loan this to you if you agree to race it. So I thought about, I mean, I had one in middle school and two in high school. I'm like, I'm not going to be racing this, but I said, okay, send it to me. And, uh, I wasn't really sure if I was going to race it or not, but then I have a great group of training friends and that spring we all went up to Placid and uh, we, and I brought the trike with me, which is a very different thing to learn how to ride. And if someone, actually, if someone had said to me, would would you ride an adult tricycle? I would have been like, absolutely not. I'm done riding. But when I saw Steve riding it, 
I, I thought ah, this is might be doable. So I went up to Placid and all my friends, they made like a little cocoon around me just as we didn't know what it would be like up there in the roads and all that. And after about 20 miles, they're like, oh yeah, we can leave her. She's fine. <laughs> like I, I realized I can do this. Um, yeah, and, and in fact, about a month or two later, we always go to this, it's a hill climb series in, in Wachusett, Massachusetts. Literally, we drive four and a half hours to ride our bicycle up three and a half miles up a ski slope because it's just a girl's weekend away. And that's what right. we, we did. And I went up there that year and I actually rode faster on that 30 pound bike than on my two wheel bike because I wasn't fighting my balance the whole time. Interesting. So, so that's what turned me and said, well, I guess I guess I'll go and try and race it. And that was um, in 2014. I went to the Para National Cycling uh, National Championship in uh Where's the big Trek store in Madison, Wisconsin? Yeah. And uh, I, I won my category. There was only a handful of people, but it showed them I was fast enough that I would be competitive internationally. So it was kind of like an out of body experience. Two weeks later, I'm at the Olympic Training Center at a training camp. I'm like, whoa, whoa, what has happened to my life? Two weeks later, I'm at the World Championship, which happened to be in the United States, which was fortunate because I think it would have been overwhelming if I had to travel to it. And I won two medals. And then since then, it's just been like, boom. And I got to go to Rio and I got to go to Tokyo. So yeah, it's been an amazing ride. Who would have ever figured that when you get all of a sudden you go from not being able to really ride a two wheel bike safely to dominating on a three wheel bike? Yeah. And did it surprise you that you were faster? Because I would look at that three wheel bike and go, that's got to be so much heavier. It's going to be way slower. When you take away, I mean, it is slower, but when you take away, I'm not fighting to try and balance myself. I can take nutrition on the bike. I can do things that I couldn't do anymore on my two wheel yeah. bike. It just makes a big difference, um, makes it doable for me. So you did the whole MDC, Million Dollar Challenge on a two wheel bike back in, yes. back in the day. And so- 2013, yeah. 13, have you done it since? Oh yeah, I've done it 16, 17, 18, 19, and I'm doing it again this year. You are doing it this year. And yeah. what is it about that event that makes it so special? Yeah, well, it's just amazing. And not too often are you around that many challenged athletes. I guess when I travel with the team, I am. But it's just like it's so accepting of where you are physically. And then and like you don't get like there's so many people with challenges. Like it's not unusual to have a challenge. So right, it's more normal. I don't know how to. Yeah, no, it's it. They're everybody under the athletes. One of the reasons that the event's so successful is people want to see their dollars at work. They want to see the fact that they're helping to provide grants to athletes like yourself to go to world championships, go to Paralympics, and then they get to see it live and in color and go, wow, that trike just kicked my butt going up that hill. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And, so, it, and me, a lot of it is knowing that it's possible. Like, had I not seen Steven ride that trike and yeah. be, for the most part, keep up with everybody, I wouldn't have known it was possible. Like, it, like I said before, if someone said, do you want to ride an adult tricycle? I would have been, no, thank you. But seeing it in action made a big difference for me. What was the race that made you realize that, okay, I, I can be really good at this? And because I'm sure you didn't know much about Paralympics before this, no. the fact that in, yeah. and as a able-bodied athlete, you weren't thinking about going to the Olympics. So no. to find out what was there one race where you found out it, basically at the end of that race or during that race, wait a second, I could possibly race internationally here. Um, well, I, you know, like I said, it was just like a whirlwind for me to go to my first world championship, but the following year, when I was traveling with the team internationally yeah, and I saw more international competition, that's when I thought, oh, I might be able to do this. Like, and it wasn't until actually I was named to the team to go to, to uh, Rio that it really dawned on me that, oh yeah, this is, this is possible. And what was the feeling like when you got your first Paralympic medal? Yeah, that was like a, and what, more, the more poignant moment to me was yeah. um, that year prior to the Olympic Games, they have um, the Pan American Games. It's the America's Pair race. Pans. Yes. And I got to go to the Pair of Pans in Toronto in 2015. And I went to the opening ceremony and it was 
like was it at, not at the same venue as the able-bodied opening ceremony and even that there was like 30 percent of the stands were filled and so I thought eh so when I went to Tokyo um I signed up to go to the opening ceremony because how often can you do that in your life and I was kind of thinking it was just going to be like the Pan Am games where it's not really that big of a deal so we everything in a game situation takes longer like you have to go take the transportation like hours ahead of time so it's like so hot and humid down there we're wearing this wool blazer jeans these uncomfortable shoes like <laughs> waiting in line they give you like this piece of bread and water to eat I mean it was just like really long and it, you can't they didn't have any like closed server tv so you didn't know what was happening in the stadium so it was our turn to go in the United States it was like the middle of, middle of the alphabet and we entered like how football players come out yeah through the tunnel and we came out and every single seat was full and all you could see was lights from the cell phones like people take and I like it literally took the breath out of my body like I couldn't breathe like because I wasn't expecting it and then it like dawns on me I am representing the United States of America on the second biggest stage versus the Olympics opening ceremonies and second is ours and it like all of a sudden it hit me like I am doing and then of course I'm crying and I don't cry cute and I'm crying uh, that's the moment that it really hit me. Like, I am here. I am doing this. That was like so amazing. The Brazilian people were like crazy passionate fans. I mean, every seat was full. All you could see was cell phone lights going off. It was just so amazing. So how have your kids adapted to all this? Uh, you have three kids, Griffin, Sullivan, and Julia. Have they, have they loved this? My, my mom is a, is a medalist in the Paralympic Games. <laughs> funny story on that my daughter was a senior in high school when I went to Rio and uh, I won two medals she got to miss her first week of senior year to go with my husband down there my sister and her husband and my niece they were all down there and um, you know she I don't think they think much of it it's just my mother she's always done things like that and I came home and her high school did a story on me and they interviewed me and asked me some for some pictures and we, as part of being a, a Paralympian and an Olympian, you get to go to the White House and meet the president. So I had gone to the White House and, and President Obama was the president. And then they take pictures. And then her school had a picture of Michelle Obama giving me a hug. And that is what my daughter gleamed on. Michelle Obama hugged you, mom. Like and all of a sudden I was somebody. <laughs> Michelle Obama gave me a hug. I'm like, really? Of all the things I've done, that's the thing that you the, the, the going to Tokyo, the going to Rio, the, all the different stuff that, that, but you got hugged by the first lady. That's right. So. Street cred. You got street cred. I like it. That is so cool. I love that. And uh, in terms of your experiences on MDC, you've done it so many times. Do you have a favorite experience from your, from those uh, years of riding MDC? I think the in 2016, when I went back after I had been riding the trike and I was on a different bike, um, that was the year of the rain too. So that was a tough year to ride it, but it was yes, the year it of the was. rain. <laughs> I think uh, you had every plague but locusts. I think you had hail, <laughs> sleep, wind in the rain. flat tires, everything. But um, just totally lost my train of thought. What did the, um, the year of the rain? Rain. Yeah, and when uh, the... Thursday night, they gave me an award for Queen of the Mountain because they had seen me struggle so much when I was on a two wheel bike. And then I really wasn't struggling when I was on the three wheel bike. And they're like, oh, you've really improved. And it's like, no, I haven't improved. I'm just on the right piece of equipment. Thank you very much, CAF. Like it was, that was the most amazing moment to me to be recognized that, oh, how like you're on the right piece of equipment. Look how, look how much better you're doing, how much better you feel. It was just, that was amazing to me. So one of the people who probably doesn't get the cred, credit he deserves is Steve Peace for being that trike whisperer and, and getting people like yourself to realize, wait a second, I can still ride a bike and forget about the Paralympics and everything is great, but just the fact that you can ride around the neighborhood again, because your balance is compromised. You can't ride a regular a two wheel bike. Talk a little about Steve and, and how impactful he's been. Uh, Steve has been amazingly impactful. I, I call him the trike whisperer. I mean, he um, went into the Navy right after high school. Since all of this, Stephen and Sarah and my husband, and her, we've all become very good friends. So I even have my own bedroom at their house because <laughs> I train out there because I live where it snows. But, um, you know, he graduated from high school, went into the Navy. And then after four years in the Navy, he was a 
given a slot to go to the Naval Academy and he went to the Naval Academy. So, I mean, his life was on a trajectory going yep. that way. And then he has this debilitating stroke. I think he's 31 years old. He's laying in his apartment and they're wondering how come Steve's not at work and they find him. And I mean, talk about your life all of a sudden taking a turn. And he's taken that and put nothing but positive into it. I would say every single person who rides a trike in the United States is connected to Steve. Like he has been the one to, to have that happen to like reaching out, I'll loan you an axle. He saw potential in me and he's like, no, and like he kept pushing, you have to race and you'll do well. And so he has, even if he doesn't know it's he's changed so many lives just love by it. being him. I love it. Hey Joe, congratulations on everything you've done and have fun at, at your, at the MDC coming up in, in a few weeks. Yeah, I'm excited about it. It's been a long time. I missed last year. It's, it's, yeah. Well, we haven't had it since 19. I know. We're all ready to go. Jill Walsh has been our guest. Everybody, again, this is CAF's Heroes of Sport. My name is Bob Abbott. Jill, you are the best. Thank you for everything you bring to CAF. Thanks, Bob. I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Absolutely. Again, everybody, thanks again for tuning in. We'll catch you next time.